the genesis of tactic proxy. The greatest barrier to communication between myself and would-be organizers arises when I try to get across the concept that tactics are not the product of careful cold reason, that they do not follow a, a table of organization or plan of attack. Accident, unpredictable reactions to your own actions, necessity, and improvisation dictate the direction and nature of tactics. Then, analytical logic is required to appraise where you are, what you can do next, and the risks and hopes that you can look forward to. It is this analysis that protects you from being a blind prisoner of the tactic and the accidents that accompany it. But I cannot overemphasize that the tactic itself comes out of the free flow of action and reaction and requires on the part of the organizer an easy acceptance of apparent disorganization. The organizer goes with the action. His approach may be free, open-ended, curious, sensitive to any opportunities, any handles to grab onto, even though they involve other issues than those they may have in mind at the particular time. The organizer should never feel lost because they have no plot, no timetable, or definite points of reference. A great pragmatist, Abraham Lincoln, told his secretary in the month the war began, My policy is to have no policy. Three years later, in a letter to a Kentucky friend, he confessed plainly, I have been controlled by events. The major problem in trying to communicate this idea is that it is outside the experience of practically everyone who's been exposed to our alleged education system. The products of this system have been trained to emphasize order, logic, rational thought, direction, and purpose. We call it mental discipline, and it results in a structured, static, closed, rigid mental makeup. Even a phrase such as being open-minded becomes just a verbalism. Happenings that cannot be understood at the time or don't fit into the accumulated educational pattern are considered strange, suspect, and to be avoided. For anyone to understand what anyone else is doing, they have to have had a, an underst uh, to understand it in terms of logic, rational decision, a decision, and deliberate conscious action. Therefore, when you try to communicate the whys and wherefores of your actions, you are compelled to fabricate these logical, rational, structured reasons to rationalizations. This is not how it is in real life. Since the nature of the development of tactics cannot be described as a general proposition, I shall attempt instead to present a case study of the development of the proxy tactic, one that promises to be a major tactic for many years to come. I shall try to take the reader into my experience with the hope that afterward they will reflect candidly upon the hows and whys of their own tactical experience. We know that we are predominantly a middle-class society living in a corporate economy, an economy that tends to form conglomerates so that in order to, uh, to know where the power lies, you have to find out who owns whom. For some years past, it has been like trying to find the P in the shell game. But now there are strobe lights flashing for further confusion. The one thing certain is that masses of middle-class Americans are ready to move toward major confrontations with corporate America. College students have argued that their administrations should give student committees the proxies in their stock portfolios for use in the struggle for peace and against pollution, inflation, racially discriminatory policies, and other social ills. Citizens from Baltimore to Los Angeles are organizing proxy groups to pool their votes for action on the social and political policies of their corporations. Feeling the national proxy organization may give them, for the first time, the power to do something, they're now waking to a growing interest in the relationship of their corporate holdings to the Pentagon. The, this pragmatic means towards political action has loosened new forces. Recently, I talked to three students at Stanford's uh, School of Business Administration about their ways and means of proxy use. I asked them what their major goal was, and they responded, getting out of Vietnam. They shook their heads when I asked whether they had been active on the issue. Why not? I inquired. Their answer was that they didn't believe in the effectiveness of demonstration in the streets and recoiled from such actions as carrying Viet Cong flags, draft card burnings, or draft evasion, but they did believe in the use of proxies. Enter three new recruits. You can depend upon the establishment to radicalize them further. 
Like any new political program, the proxy tactic was not the result of reason and logic. It was part accident, part necessity, part response to reaction, and part imagination, each part affecting the other. Of course, imagination is also tactical sensitivity. When the accident happens, the imaginative organizer recognizes it and grabs it before it slips by. <clears throat> the various accounts of the history of the development of the proxy tactics show a line of reason, purpose, and order that were never there. The mythology of history is usually so pleasant for the ego of the subject that they accept it in modest silence an affirmation of the validity of the mythology. After a while, they begin to believe it. <clears throat> the further danger of mythology is that it carries the picture of genius at work with the false implication of purposeful logic and planned actions. This makes it more difficult to free oneself from the structured approach. For this, if, there, if no other reason, mythology should be understood for what it is. The history of Chicago's Back of the Yards Council reads, Out from the gutters, the bars, the churches, the labor unions, yes, even the communist and socialist parties, the neighborhood businessmen's associations, the American Legion, and Chicago's Catholic Bishop Bernard Scheel, they all came together on July 14th, 1939. July 14th, Bastille Day, their Bastille Day, the day they celebrated and symbolically selected to join together to storm the barricades of unemployment, rotten housing, disease, delinquency, and demoralization. That's the way it reads. What really happened is that July 14th was selected because it was the one day the public park field house was clear. The one day that the labor unions had no scheduled meetings. The day that many priests thought was best. The one day that the late Bishop Scheel was free. There wasn't a thought of Bastille Day in, our, in any of our minds. That day, at a press conference before the convention came, uh, came to order, a reporter uh, asked me, don't you think it's somewhat too revolutionary to deliberately select Bastille Day for your first convention? I tried to cover my surprise, but I thought, how wonderful, what a windfall. I answered, not at all. It is fitting that we do so, and that's why we did it. I quickly informed all the speakers about Bastille Day, and it became the keynote of nearly every speech. And so history records it as a calculated, planned tactic. The difference between fact and history was brought home when I was vi a visiting professor at a certain Eastern university. Two candidates there were taking their written examinations for the doctorate in community organization and criminology. I persuaded the president of this college to give me a copy of this examination, and when I answered the questions, the departmental head graded my paper, knowing only that I was an anonymous friend of the president. Three of the questions were on the philosophy and motivations of Saul Alinsky. I answered two of them incorrectly. I did not know what my philosophy or motivations were, but they did. I remember that when I organized the back of the yards in Chicago. I made many moves more almost intuitively. But when I was asked to explain what I had done and why, I had, I had to come up with reasons. Reasons that were not present at the time. What I did at the time, I did because that was the thing to do. It was the best thing to do, or it was the only thing to do. However, when pressed for reasons, I had to start considering an intellectual scaffold for my past actions, really rationalizations. I can remember the reasons being so convincing, even to myself, that I thought, why, of course I did it for those reasons. I should have known that was why I did it. Uh Fucking the proxy tactic was born in Rochester, New York, in the conflict between Eastman Kodak and the black ghetto organization called Fight. Our foundation had helped to organize. The issues of the conflict are not relevant to the present subject, except that a vice president of Kodak assigned to negotiate with Fight reached an agreement with Fight, and that seemed to close the matter. Enter the first accident. For Kodak, then repudiated by its own vice president and the agreement he had made, this reopened the battle. 
If Kodak had not reneged, the issue would have ended there. Now, necessity moved in. As the lines were drawn for battle, it became clear that the usual strategy of demonstrations and confrontations would be unavailing. While Kodak's buildings and administration were in Rochester, its real life was throughout its American and overseas markets. Demonstrations might be embarrassing and inconvenient, but they would not be the tactic to force an agreement. It wasn't Rochester that Eastman Kodak was concerned about. Their image in the community could always be sustained by sheer financial power. Their vulnerability was throughout the nation and overseas. We, began, we then began looking for appropriate tactics. An economic boycott was rejected because of Kodak's overwhelming domination of the film negative market. Thus, a call for an economic boycott would have been asking the American people to stop taking pictures, which obviously would not work as long as babies were being born, children were graduating, having birthday parties, getting married, going on picnics, and so forth. The idea of boycott did evoke thoughts of checking out the Sherman Antitrust Act against them at some point. Other wild ideas were tossed around as well. The proxy idea first came up as a way to gain entrance to the annual stockholders meeting for harassment and publicity. And again, accident and necessity played a part. I had recently accepted a number of invitations to address universities, religious conventions, and similar organizations in various parts of the United States. Why not talk to them about the Kodak fight battle and ask for proxies? Why not accept all speaking invitations even? If it meant 90 consecutive days in 90 different places, it wouldn't cost us a penny. These places not only paid fees to my organization, but they also paid travel expenses. <clears throat> and so it began with nothing specific in mind except to ask Eastman Kodak stockholders to assign their proxies to the Rochester Black Organization or come to the stockholders meeting and vote in favor of fight. There was never any thought, then or now, of using proxies to gain economic power inside the corporation or to elect directors of the board. I couldn't be less interested in having a couple of directors elected to the board of Kodak or any other corporation. As long as the opposition has the majority, that's it. Also, boards of directors are only rubber stamps of management. With the exception of some management people retired to the board, the rest of them don't know which way is up. The first real breakthrough followed my address to the National Utilitarian Convention in Denver on May 3rd, 1967, in which I asked for and received the passage of a resolution that the proxies of their organization would be given to fight. The reactions of the local politicians made me realize that senators and congressmen up for re-election would turn to their research directors and ask, how many unit Unitarians have I got in my district? The proxy tactic now began to look like a possible political bank shot. Political leaders who saw their churches as signing proxies to us could see them assigning their votes as well. This meant political power. Kodak has money, but money counts in elections for television time, newspaper ads, political workers, publicity, payoffs, and pressures. If this fails to get the vote, money is politically useless. It was obvious that politicians who would support us had everything to gain. Proxies were now seen as proof of political intent if they came from large membership organizations. The church organization had mass members, voters. It meant publicity, and publicity meant pressure on political candidates and incumbents. We hoisted a banner with our slogan, Keep your sermons, give us your proxies, and set sail into the sea of churches. I couldn't help noting the irony that churches, having sold their spiritual birthright in exchange for donations of stock, could now go straight again by giving their proxies to the poor. The pressure began to build. Only, my only concern was whether Kodak would get the message. Never before or since have I encountered an American corporation so politically insensitive. I wondered whether Kodak would have, uh, would have to be brought before a Senate subcommittee hearing before it would wake up and give in. The building of political support would have prepared the ground for two actions a Senate subcommittee hearing in which a number of practices would be exposed, and two, the possibility of an investigation by the Attorney General's office. 
Kodak would reconsider dealing with us if those two were the alternatives. I had an understanding with the late Senator Robert Kennedy to advise him when we were ready to move. In my discussions with Kennedy, I found that his commitment was not political but human. He was outraged by the conditions in the Rochester ghetto. I began looking over the national scene for avenues of attack. Foundations such as Ford, Rockefeller, Carnegie, and others with substantial investments were ostensibly committed to social progress. So were union retirement funds. I planned to ask them, if you're on the level, then prove it at no cost to yourselves. We're not asking for a penny, just assign us the proxies of the stock you hold. The effective foundation proxies would, of course, be marginal since their proxies, unlike those of the churches, represented no constituencies. Even so, they weren't to be dismissed. Other ideas then began to occur. This was a whole new ball game for me and my curiosity sent me scurrying and sniffing at many opportunities in this great Wall Street wonderland. I, don't, I didn't know where I was going, but that part was of the fascination. I wasn't the least worried. I knew that accident or necessity or both would tell us, hey, go this way. Since I didn't seem disturbed or confused, everyone believed I had a secret and totally organized Machiavellian campaign. No one suspected the truth. The Los Angeles Times said, the Kodak proxy battle created waves throughout the corporate world. Heads of several large corporations and representatives of some mutual funds have tried to contact Alinsky for, uh, to ferret out the rest of his plans. One corporation executive told a reporter, when I asked him what he was going to do next, he said he did not know. I do not believe that. A reporter asked Alinsky what he's going to do next with the proxies. Quote, I honestly do not know, he said. Sure, I have plans, but you know. That a, th that a thing like this opens up its own possibilities, things you never thought of. Man, we can have a ball, a real ball. This was all virgin territory. In the past, a few individuals had gone to stockholders meetings to sound off, but at best they were minor irritants. No one had ever organized a campaign to use proxies for social and political purpose. The good old establishment made, us, made its usual con a contribution. Corporate, uh, corporation executives sought me out. Their anxious questions convinced me that we had the razor to cut through the golden curtain that protected the so-called private sector from facing public responsibilities. Business publications added their violent attacks and convinced me further. In all my wars with the establishment, I had never seen it so uptight. I knew there was dynamite in the proxy scene, but where, where meant how. As I meandered around this jungle, looking for some kind of a, patter, a power pattern, I began to notice things. Look, DuPont owns a nice piece of Kodak, and so does this and that corporation. And those mutual funds, they've got more than $60 billion in stock investments, and their holdings include Kodi a Kodak. After all, Mutual funds have annual meetings and proxies too. Suppose we had proxies in every corporation in America and suppose we were fighting Corporation X and suppose we also had proxies for the various corporations that had stock in Corporation X and proxies for other corporations that had stock in corporations that had stock in Corporation X. Soon, I was intoxicated by the possibilities. You could begin to play the whole Wall Street board up and down. You could go to, say, Corporation Z, point out your proxy holding there, mention that there were certain grievances you had against them for some of their bad policy operations, but that you were willing to forget about them for the time being. If they would use their stock to put pressure on Corporation Q for the sake of influencing Corporation X. The same muscle could be applied to Corporation Q itself. You could make, deal, make your deals up and down. Always operating in your favor was the self-interest of the corporations and the fact that they hate each other. This is what I would call corporate jujitsu. Recently, I was at a luncheon meeting with a number of presidents of major corporations where one of them expressed his fear that I saw things only in terms of power rather from the point of view of goodwill and reason. 
I replied that when he and his corporation approached other corporations in term of in terms of reason, goodwill, and cooperation, instead of going for the jugular, that would be the day that I would be happy to pursue the conversation. The conversation was dropped. Proxies represent a key to participation by the middle class, but the question was how to organize it. Imagination had had its moment. It was time for accident or necessity to both come on stage. I found myself saying, accident, accident, where the hell are you? Then it came. The Los Angeles Times carried a front page story on the proxy tactic. Soon, we were deluged with mail, including sackfuls of proxies of different corporations. One letter read, I have $10,000 to invest. What kind of stock should I buy? What kind of proxies do you need? Should I buy Dow Chemical? But the two most important letters provided the accident that pointed to the next step. Quote, enclosed, find my proxies. I wonder whether you have heard from anyone else in my suburb. If you have... I would appreciate receiving their names and addresses so that I can call a house meeting and organize a San Fernando Valley chapter of proxies for people. The second letter said, I'm all for it, but I don't know why you should have the right to decide which corporation should be attacked. After all, they are our proxies and we would like to have something to say about it. Also, we don't know why you should go to the board meetings with our proxies. Why can't we go to our proxy with our proxies? Of course, all organized and knowing what we want, but we would like to go ourselves. It was those two letters that kicked open the door. Of course. For years I'd been saying power is with people. How stupid could I have been? There it was. Instead of annual put-ons like Eastman Kodak's in Flemington, New Jersey, where the company buses down a dozen loads of stockholding payrollers to a public school auditorium for a day off with a pay and a free lunch, and a crummy one at that, they sing out their Sig Heils and back to Rochester. Let's make them hold their meetings in New Jersey or Newark in the ballpark or outdoors in Atlantic City where thousands and thousands of proxy holders can attend. Yankee Stadium in New York or Soldier Field in Chicago would be better. But many of America's corporations are incorporated in special protective sanctuaries like New Jersey or Delaware and would claim that they must meet in these states. Well, President Nixon had set up the precedent for sanctuaries. Let's see what happens when Flemington, New Jersey, with its one beat-up hotel and two motels, faces an invasion of 50,000 stockholders. Will the state call out the National Guard to keep stockholders out of their annual meeting? Remember, these are not hippies, but American citizens in the most establishment sense. Stockholders. What could be more American than that? Let's imagine a situation in which 75,000 people vote no, and one man says, on behalf of the majority of the proxies assigned to management, I vote I, and the eyes have it. I would dare management to expose themselves in this way. But the real importance of those letters was that they showed a way for the middle class to organize. These people, the vast majority of Americans who feel helpless in the huge corporate economy, who don't know which way to turn, have begun to turn away from America to abdicate as citizens. Their rationalization, they rationalize their actions by saying that, after all, the experts and the government will take care of, of, uh, of it all. They are like the have-nots who, when unorganized and powerless, simply resign themselves to a sad scene. Proxies can be the mechanism by which these people can organize, and once they are organized, they will re-enter the life of politics. Once organized around proxies, they will have a reason to examine, to become educated about, the various corporation policies and practices, both domestic and foreign, because now... They can do something about them. There will, be, there will even be fringe benefits. Trips to stockholder meetings will bring drama and adventure into otherwise colorless and sedentary suburban lives. Proxy organizations will help bridge the generation gap as parents and children join in the battle against the Pentagon and corporations. Proxies can be the effective path to the Pentagon. The late General Douglas MacArthur, in his farewell speech to Congress, uttered 
a half-truth. Old generals never die. They just fade away. General MacArthur should have completed his statement by saying, they fade away to Lockheed, Boeing, General Dynamics, and other corporations. Two years before retirement, a general will be found already scouting and setting up his fade-away corporate sanctuary. One can envisage, envisage the scene where a general informs a corporate executive that a $50 million order will be coming to the corporation for the making of nerve gas, napalm, defoliants, or any of, uh, other of the great products we export for the benefit of mankind. Instead of a reaction of gratitude and a, general, and a general, as soon as you retire, we would like to talk to you about your future, he encounters a, well, look, general, I appreciate you're considering us for this contract, but we've got stockholders meeting coming up next month. And the hell that would blow when these thousands of stockholders heard about it. Well, general, I don't want to think about it. And we certainly couldn't keep it quiet. It's been very nice seeing you. Now, what has happened? First of all, the general has suddenly realized that corporations are backing away from the whole war scene. Secondly, the fact that thousands of stockholders would be opposed to this becomes translated to him as thousands of American citizens. Not long hairs, not troublemakers, not reds, but 200% bona fide Americans. One could begin to communicate with the unique, allegedly, mentality of the Pentagon species. What will be required is a computerized operation that will quickly give, one, a breakdown of the holdings of any corporation, two, a breakdown of holdings of other corporations that own shares in the target corporation, and three, a breakdown of individual stock proxies in the target corporation and in the corporations that have holdings in the target corporation. It will be necessary to keep the records of individual proxies confidential to protect people who would rather not let their neighbors know how many stocks they own. There will be a nationwide organization set up either by well, myself or others with national headquarters in Chicago or New York or both. The New York office could handle all of the computerized operations with the Chicago office serving as headquarters for staff of organizers who would be constantly on the move through the various communities of America from San Fernando Valley to Baltimore and all places in between. Responding to the interests and requests of local suburban groups, they would be using their skills to set up organization meetings and to train volunteer, uh, volunteer organizations to carry on. The staff organizers would approach each scene with only one thing in mind, to get a mass-based middle-class organization started. The proxy tactic will be common to all these groups, and each group will gather in any other issues around which people will organize. They may start by setting up study groups on corporate policies, making recommendations as to the corporations which should be communicated with, and electing one of theirs as a representative to a national board. The national board will be responsible for the decisions as to corporate targets, issues and policies, and various other uh, uh, matters. The various representatives on the national board will also be responsible for recruiting members of their own local organizations for attendance at the annual stockholders meeting. On this national board will also be representatives of all kinds of consumer organizations as well as churches and other institutions committed to this program. They'd be able to contribute individually, individual uh, invaluable technical advice as well as support of their own membership. And remember, the, object, uh, the objective of the proxy's approach is not simply a power instrument with reference to our corporate economy, but a mechanism providing for a blast-off for middle-class organization, beginning with the proxy. It will be, then begin to ignite other rockets on the whole political scene from local elections to Congress. Once a person, once a people are organized, they will keep moving from issue to issue. People power is the real objective. The proxies are simply a means to the end. This total operation would require special fundraising for a budget essential to the operation. There are many who are already volunteering time and money, but the fundraising will be difficult since it's obvious that there will be no contributions from corporations or foundations. Also, none of the contributions would be tax deductible. Unquestionably, corporations would fight back by pointing out to stockholders that prevention programs on um, pollution, the rejection of war contracts, or other demands of the stockholders will result in diminished dividends. 
By the time this occurs, the stockholders will find such satisfaction and meaningfulness in their campaign that these will become more important than the cut in dividends, ideally. Corporations will change their cor contribution of stocks to universities. Already it's said that the University of Rochester's Kodak stock cannot be voted by the university, that the voting power is retained by Kodak management, and this presents an interesting legal question. These are some of the potentials and problems of the, uh, of the proxy operation on the American scene. It can mark the beginning of a whole new kind of campaign on campuses against university administration through their stock holdings. On May 12, 1970, the Stanford University trustees voted their 24,000 shares of General Motors stock in favor of management in disregard of Stanford student proposals to use, to use the stock proxies against management. The same at University of California with 100,000 shares, University of Michigan with 29,000 shares, University of Texas with 66,000 shares, Harvard with 287,000 shares, and MIT with 291,500 shares. The exceptions were the University of Pennsylvania and Antioch College, where their respective 29,000 and 1,000 shares were voted for a student-supported proposal. Talk about a relevant college curriculum. What could be more educational than for students to begin to study American corporation policy and to get involved at stockholders' meetings by means of university proxies? For years, universities have, without compunction, gone in for what they call field research and action programs amongst the poor. But when it comes to research plus action among corporations, they tend to balk. I suggest that America's corporations are a spiritual slum, and their arrogance is the major threat to our future as a free society. There will and there should be a major struggle on the university campuses on this, of this country on this issue. If I go into this, as, uh, if, if I go into this it means me, uh, leaving the Industrial Areas Foundation after 30 years, the organization that I built. What will probably happen will be that others will come forth to give full time to this campaign and that I would be with it full time for its launching and its setting out of c to sea. But if after what we've seen about the genesis of the tactic, uh, tactic proxy, it's not clear that the genesis of proxies for people is unpredictable, that it will develop by accidents, needs, and imagination, then both of us have wasted our time, me in recording all this and you in reading it. Recently, one of President Nixon's chief White House advisors told me proxies for people would mean revolution. They'll never let you get away with it. I believe he's right that it would mean revolution. It could mean the organization for power of a previously silent people. The way of proxy participation could mean the democratization of corporate America. It could result in the changing of the foreign operations, which would cause major shifts in national foreign policy. This could be one of the single most important breakthroughs in the revolutions of our times.